Hello. We just, uh, thanks for being patient. We gave everybody a couple more minutes because thank you for finding this place. Um, my name is Aaron Blashus. I'm a product manager in Google Compute Engine. And I'm joined by Patrick Hansel today, a software engineer from Improbable. And we're here to talk to you about choosing the right GCE instance for your workload. <clears throat> so first off, um, the survey will open 20 minutes into the session. Your feedback is always appreciated. Uh, each year we try and bring the most relevant content to you at the right level to ensure that you get the most out of these events, because we know they're not easy, uh, they're a good use of your time, uh, you know, travel, etc. But I would ask you to be gentle, since both Patrick and I are substitute speakers. This was not our original um, uh, session, but they pulled us off the bench for it. So if you're going to give us a survey, please be gentle. But jumping in, um, we're going to start with a question. What does, your workload, what, what does your workload look like? If I was to ask everyone in the room what their workloads look like, I would probably get hundreds, perhaps thousands of answers. They are different applications. They, they run in different infrastructures. They have different, potentially different processing architectures, like CPU or GPU. Some of you might be focused on running high-performance web applications. Others might be looking for a way to run ERP. Some might be looking for an easy way to burst into the cloud to free up availability on-prem. Some might be trying to move completely from on-prem into, into the cloud. And GCE can address each of those concerns. And when we talk to uh, Patrick, he will talk to you about uh, his primary concern, which is multiplayer gaming. So with all these different um, use cases for cloud, I'd like to ask another question, which is, how do, you find, how do you find the process of matching your needs uh, to the capabilities of the cloud? Is it easy to look at the, the different offerings from everyone and identify which VM families uh, for the workload that might fit? Is it easy to understand where the avail availability is that you need? Is it easy to understand whether or not it will fit within your budget? I bet you that uh, if you look at all the variety of offerings that are out there today, this answer is not always easy. You could typically find yourself looking through catalogs of instance types, uh, trying to compare different performance ratios, capacity of capabilities, not to mention the different price options that are out there. And what happens when, you're pr when your needs change? Do you have to repeat the whole process again? The GCP team believes that it doesn't have to be this way. And that is why we have always chosen to have a very different approach from day one. We understand that you need simplicity to make your decision easy. You don't want to spend hours studying a product catalog to try and figure out what you need. We know that you need flexibility because your, uh, your needs change and your environment changes uh, from per day to day or perhaps over the years. And finally, you've always wanted to prioritize efficiency. Because in the cloud, you shouldn't be forced more resources than you need. Go to the cloud so you can say, hey, I'm only going to buy as much as I need and have it be available whenever I need it. And of course, you should be able to leverage the intelligence of the platform to make sure that you stay within your budget. GCB has always had the most flexible and most cost-effective of the cloud architectures because, of course, it was built on Google. And this year, we introduced workload-specific families uh, so that we could optimize and provide, uh, provide more choice to customers for, uh, for things like uh, compute optimized or memory optimized. So you have your general purpose families with N1 and N2, which we introduced this year. And these families are simple, flexible, and the best fit for most workloads. They are available in either predefined, so you can just pick one of whatever we've decided, like number of processors to the number of memory. Or you can choose um, any, any, any size that you want. The number of CPUs to the number of memory doesn't have to be something that we decide. It can be something that you have decided for your own that fits best for your workload. You can also use it to cost optimize for, uh, for licensing concerns, if you wish. And then this year, we put in, we, we introduced, uh, I think uh, just a few months ago, Compute Optimized C2. 
And these are the best fit for compute intensive workloads, including AAA gaming. Uh, that's what we'll hear about from Patrick. Electronic design automation, HPC, uh, those kinds of things. They, are, they come with 3.8 uh, gigahertz all-core turbos and offer 40% um, higher performance compared to standard GCE general purpose families. And finally, we'll talk about our memory-optimized M2 families, which uh, is fit for memory-intensive workloads like SAP, HANA, databases, memory analytics, uh, those kinds of things. And it can go from uh, 15 or to up to 25 to 1 uh, uh, ratios of per core to memory. They can be configured up to 12 terabytes today, but we, are, uh, we have much larger sizes on the near horizon for anybody who's looking for that. So, now that you know that what the family's offering looks like, how do you pick the right shape for your application? And remember, it's supposed to be simple. So first, let's, re um, let's review what is uh, definitely a majority of the workloads, the majority of the workloads that we see uh, customers using, and you know, that our data shows that fits of most of the applications that are in your environment. And these VMs are designed to be simple, flexible, and fit a majority of your operational tasks. They offer flexible sizing. Um, they, and in most cases, they shouldn't have to be something that you have to spend a lot of time thinking about. They have a wide range of, of memory to CPU ratios, up to eight gigabytes per vCPU. And of course, they have custom machine typing, which I talked about earlier, where you can scale uh, depending on what you, what you want, including uh, considerably more memory. Like, like I said, you might have a lot more memory to a very small number of cores to optimize for licensing. With custom machine types, you can actually get the exact fit for your VM capabilities. Put simply, it gives you the power to create customized instances. Um, you're not restricted to what you would normally see for, um, to, for a particular type of balance because of the infrastructure that, uh, that, that, Google, that Google runs, that GCE utilizes. <clears throat> you can take custom machine types and extend the memory for workloads. Um, you know, that you say, hey, I really want to make sure that I have a lot of large memory concern, and normally on, say, on-prem or within a uh, on-prem on virtual or on-prem bare metal environment, you would be restricted to a particular t uh, set of ratios. But with uh, custom, custom VMs, we actually we give you the freedom to uh, go as far as you would like, farther than sometimes people are, are comfortable with, with the number of CPUs. You can really scale that memory up if you wanted to. Another feature that we, that we like to rave about and is actually one of my personal favorites is right sizing. So with right sizing, it helps customers to only pay for as much as they need. And what happens is that we take eight days of, of, uh, of your usage, right? And we take the, uh, the information that we get from Stackdriver and we make a recommendation to the customer about what the size of their, uh, what the size of their VM should look like. And because you're, we scale and charge per core and per memory, if you're using uh, too much or too little, we could say, hey, you know what, we're not seeing the best performance for you here. We think you could save money on this particular VM there. And this happens all the time. So you are, you are, we are actually trying to let it, uh, make it so that you pay us less on a, on, a, uh, on a regular basis because we believe that, like I said, you should be able to take advantage of the intelligence that's built into the platform. General purpose VMs also adapt as your workload changes, right? So if you want to, is, let's say that for a while you might need to take advantage of um, high I.O. You can, let's say you want to attach uh, a local SSD to get, the, to get very fast performance for some period of time. Or maybe you're just like, well, right now we're just going to do some backup, so uh, the, the, the performance that I'm, I'm getting out of persistent disk is okay. Feel, you know, you can, you can change, um, change either way on the fly, and it will recalculate your costs for you. We also believe that um, the decisions on, on what you should spend your time on shouldn't be, you know, should be done for you. And this, this, is, this takes the place, or an example of this is 
flexibility as your workload changes, right? And this changes over time. What I mean by that is, let's say that you had an application that was running on, say, Haswell architecture, a CPU, an Intel uh, architecture from a while ago, um, and, but you would like to run Skylake, right? This is fairly new. You're trying to get the best out of it. We will allow you to choose the minimum CPU that, that it runs on. And as our, um, as our uh, environment grows over time and we add new architectures, you can go in and change that. Or we can automatically change it for you and say, hey, you know what, I just, maybe I want to run on a lower, on a lower, or on a, on a lower family because I've tested it and I get the better performance out of Skylake as compared to Cascade Lake or vice versa. Um, you, you can put that information into, into your VM and we will, we will automatically adjust it for you. No reboots, no, no nothing. We will just move it around uh, with the magic of the cloud. You can also do this with GPUs, which is nice. So if you select a particular GPU minimum family type, um, you can also take advantage of this same thing as we, as we introduce new families. Uh, because for instance, you might have it set up and optimized for a particular driver or, or something else, and, and you need your, your application to run on a K80 instead of a P4. So this year we also introduced um, N2, which is something that, that Patrick uh, will talk about today. And it is the next generation of our general purpose. The N2 types uh, are the, the next general purpose machine and they offer more, a little more, more flexible sizing and they, go, they can go up to 80 vCPUs. Um, and, uh, uh, um, and they also run on Cascade Lake with a much higher base frequency than our N1 family does. These also will allow you to attach uh, uh, GPUs, memory, storage, and, this, and give you the same flexibility that you had on N1, just with better performance. And in many cases, what we've seen is, is 20 to 30%. So if you are potentially more price sensitive or you're looking for the pot uh, potential of preemptibles, which I'll go in in a minute, and one might be a bed good fit for you because performance isn't your ma major concern. You're just looking to optimize for cost. But if you're looking for a general purpose optimized for performance, N2 might be a better fit. And then we also, we in alpha right now, we have uh, N2D. Um, I don't know if you've noticed this, the cloud vendors are very creative when they come up with their instance names. Uh, our N2D is our AMD family. <clears throat> and we think that it is, uh, it is going to be uh, a, an excellent offering uh, to help people who even want to go up to like memory, uh, memory sensitive workloads because the, the memory bandwidth on, on these processors is, is exceptional. Uh, we think it's a good customers who are looking for performance consistency. We think that the TCO uh, on offering on N2D will be a good fit. Um, it has an excellent uh, balance of both compute and memory for web server applications, databases, backend applications, um, things like that. Everything from media streaming um, and financial simulations have seen, uh, have seen benefits and success on our new N2Ds. Uh, and if you are interested in the alpha, uh, you can come up to me after, after the session or uh, feel free to go to our blog and it'll point you to, to a forum on where you can sign up for that. As we'll be moving, and if you can't get into the alpha uh, in the next you know, little bit, uh, we'll be moving into beta shortly. So to summarize, we've covered our general purpose VMs, right? You have a wide range of options uh, which, with a great deal of flexibility, and they support a variety of workloads from databases to web apps and dev tests and just a variety of, of and, and, and uh, GPUs. But it's kind of, once you have the, you know, and we built intelligence into it, but once you have them up and running, there's other things that you might want to do. So one of those things is to scale um, to scale with Google, right? To be able to, one of the things, appealing things about Google Cloud is, is that our scalability, um, you, you get the scalability that you have with Google. And, but you, uh, you also have the ability to uh, change your applications and be able to burst and whatnot. So we'll go into some of the, uh, the other special things that we sort of hinted on earlier. So for example, like 
bursty workloads. Um, many customers looked to Google and said, hey, uh, you know, cloud applications run at varying times, and they run at varying times all over the world, and you have peak times here and peak times there. Is there any way that I can take, um, uh, take advantage of this, of this you know, business cycle right, within the capacity in your cloud? And we, th we thought to ourselves, yes, why don't we do something about that? So we came up with preemptible VMs. And um, here we go. They're made for batch checkpointing, high available uh, workloads, things that uh, you know, might run in really large sets, but if you lose a couple of the VMs, it's not really that, uh, that, big, th that big of a deal. They're set up to run for up to 24 hours, um, and, but, um, and, and they're set to run, like I said, in large and large groups. But the advantage to them is, is that you can save up to 80% um, uh, of the cost of a typical general workload. So if your apps are fault tolerant, um, possible instance preemptions aren't a thing that you need, really need to worry about in these large batch jobs, um, you can save an incredible amount of money. Uh, we've seen success in this with media, we've seen success with this in financial services, we've seen success with this in, in healthcare, Things that people want to batch and run and that are regular and that maybe they can run off hours are something that is very, very, uh, could be a potentially a very good candidate for preemptibility. Okay. So the next one we're going to get into is the uh, compute uh, compute family, right? The, com uh, the compute optimized family. And for these intensive workloads, it's my pleasure to actually introduce someone to talk directly to you about it with real world, world experience with all of these families that we have gone over so far. Uh, Patrick Hansel from Improbable. Thank you, Patrick. Great. Thank you, Aaron. So, um, yeah, my name's Patrick. Uh, I'm a solutions engineer at Improbable here in London. Uh, I'm going to give you a, a brief insight today into how our platform uh, takes advantage of the options that GCE gives us, as Aaron was talking about. So first of all, uh, who are we and what do we do? Well, Improbable was founded uh, in London back in 2012, originally as a, a game studio uh, with the aim of building the first of a a totally new era of, of online game. But it actually wasn't long uh, before we realized that the technology that we'd built um, was actually very relevant um, to, to more than just ourselves and, and actually to, to game developers um, really building one of, of very many types of games. And since then, um, we, we've worked on giving those studios the, uh, the option to, to work with Spatial OS, which is our core uh, technology platform. So what do we actually do on a technical level then? Well, we're working on technology and practices to usher in um, a new era of, of game development. And that's really through our core tech, Spatial OS, and through our first party studios around the world. Um, so we, have, we have offices now in, um, in Europe, in London, uh, also in, in the US, Canada, and China. <clears throat> And the tech that we've built is a whole suite of software uh, that really helps at each stage of the, the game development cycle with uh, a range of core systems such as uh, game client distribution, um, logging, metrics, and user analytics infrastructure. But for this presentation, I really want to focus on our game server hosting solution and our multi-server networking stack. So our, our hosting platform has been built from the ground up using Google Cloud from day one and uses a whole bunch of, of GCP services. At the core, though, it really boils down to, to Google Kubernetes engine um, as a control plane for orchestrating and managing a fleet of services. And on top of that, Google Compute Engine as the sort of data plane uh, that runs the actual games and simulations uh, that are built on our platform by ourselves um, and also by our partners. And the second part of our core services uh, that I want to talk about is, is our multi-server networking stack. 
SpatialOS provides a way to have multiple game servers collaborate in real time uh, to simulate a virtual world that is actually hugely more complex and rich than could be handled by any single server instance. And to do that, we provide an SDK that integrates with um, any game or simulation engine. And we also provide off-the-shelf plugins and SDKs for um, popular game engines like Unity and Unreal. Let's talk a bit more about exactly uh, what game servers are and how they interact with GC on our platform. So first of all, what is a game server? Well, really, you can think of them as the, the central coordination point of most modern online games. <clears throat> They're essentially the arbiters of truth of what's actually going on in a game world. So on a technical level, they're, really, they're responsible for, for, first of all, taking input requests over the network um, from clients. So, for example, that might be you sitting at home playing on your, your PC or console. And then they use this to simulate the evolution of the world over a small time step. And once they've worked out what the, the new state of the world is, they then uh, figure out what's changed and update all the clients who then uh, come up with their own approximation of the state of the world and present that back to the players. And as you can imagine, this loop has to uh, happen incredibly fast. And actually, that's, that's really important. Games are very sensitive to latency, and it, it really doesn't take much to ruin this illusion of a sort of seamless shared world that's inhabited by, by multiple players. So the performance of a game server is clearly very important for online games. But what do we mean by performance, and, and what's a good metric of that? Well, generally, we talk about frame rate as one of those key performance metrics, which is the number of simulation steps that can be processed in a second. And a high frame rate, as well as it being stably and consistently high, is an incredibly important factor in building a game that feels good for players where inputs that they make on their controller actually feel like they're instantaneously playing out uh, to them and to other players, wherever they may be. So let's talk a bit more about how GCP actually gives us access to the right machine types for our workloads, and how that choice affects our business and those of our customers by looking at one of the games currently in development on Spatial. So I'm going to be talking about Scavengers, which is a massively impressive and exciting new game that's currently being built on our platform using Unreal Engine 4. It's in active development by um, Midwinter Entertainment, which is a team of around 35 developers based in Seattle, a lot of whom actually came from uh, working on the Halo franchise of games at 343 Industries. So they're a massively talented bunch that have a lot of experience of developing this kind of AAA online experience. And that's, when you play it, it's, it's immediately obvious. Unfortunately, this GIF actually doesn't work very well on a, on a huge screen, as we found out earlier. Um, but Scavengers is a, a survival co-opetition, uh, third-person shooter, which is set in a dystopian future where the planet's climate has collapsed, which is maybe a bit too close to home for, for some. Players fly down to the, the planet's freezing surface um, from an orbiting space station, which is inhabited by other survivors, dropping in in small teams to explore uh, a huge, uh, rich world uh, and to, to, to fight to, to survive against the, the elements of the planet. They have to defend themselves against a variety of, of passive and hostile AI while collecting weapons and equipment uh, that they need to survive. So what is it that's important to a game development team like Midwinter? Well, writing software for games is inherently very different to other types of engineering. It's ultimately a creative process, and the main objective at the end of the day is to build a fun experience. And because of that, being able to iterate quickly uh, on new designs and features is incredibly important, which means that investing in the right infrastructure and the right tooling from day one is, is really critical. 
In the case of scavengers, Midwinter knew that they wanted to create a large world with its, its own inhabitants and ecosystems. And in order to bring this to life, they needed to be able to maximize the number of concurrent players that could be connected um, while sustaining the same large AI population, which is why, for them, using spatial OS was an obvious choice. With technologies like our offloading, um, which essentially allows you to split simulation of your game across different instances of Unreal Engine, um, that's really the only way that they could reach the sort of scale and complexity that they originally had envisioned. I want to go into a little bit more detail about how this fits in with Google Cloud and what underlying compute resources we're using to develop and operate games like this. So first of all, Google Cloud's directly helping us to increase the rate at which developers, developers can iterate on their games. For example, our continuous integration infrastructure, uh, which we use for, for building uh, Unreal projects specifically, uses uh, or makes heavy usage of the N1 machine types that Aaron was talking about earlier. And they're particularly relevant to us because of the, the really high core counts that you can get with, with that machine type. So we actually use for un our Unreal code base a fleet of 96 core um, CPU optimized N1 instances. And that allows us to keep build time is very low, and to allow developers to focus on refining their systems. And for the spatial OS runtime itself, um, which you can kind of think of as the, the piece of magic that's responsible for actually routing all that information back down to game clients, we, use, uh, we make heavy usage of, of the N2 instances, uh, new N2 instances, which have, have given us some, some real performance improvements over N1s. <clears throat> The runtime, the spatial OS runtime, is designed to be distributed. And so it can, can very efficiently make use of all the cores on a single machine or across multiple instances. Import importantly, we're able to actually give this choice of hardware directly to our customers so that they can make the, the best decision based on their knowledge of, of their own game and what it requires to run. I should also add, actually, that we are currently looking into migrating from N1s to N2s for our CI infrastructure, because we've, we've actually seen that um, even though don't, we don't have access to such high core counts, um, we've still seen some, some small performance improvements with roughly the same price. And then moving on to focus on the actual machines that we use to run instances of Unreal. We decided to investigate the specific profile of Unreal Engine uh, in order to, to understand how we could optimize for the underlying hardware. And what we found is that Unreal is particularly sensitive to single core performance. And that's really because of the, the predominantly single threaded architecture that it uses, particularly for, for the servers. And with that knowledge, we ran some benchmarks against a variety of, of GCP instances. And we found that by switching from N1s and N2s to C2s, they were able to get some really huge performance improvements uh, for game servers. So as you can see here, when using the CPU-optimized C2 nodes, we we're actually able to see performance improvements of around 60%, which is clearly massive. So that's great. Um, there were some, some huge performance improvements. But what's the actual impact of that on a game level? What does, it, what does it actually translate into? Well, this really means that developers uh, on our platform, on Spatial OS, are able to push the boundaries further than ever before with their creations. The performance of the underlying hardware here has a direct impact on the, the fidelity and the complexity of the, those game worlds. And that freedom to build new types of experiences um, actually helps them to differentiate their game in what can often be a, a very crowded marketplace. And a good example of this is what we were able to do with the game's AI bots uh, because of this performance boost. The graph on the right here is um, showing a trace of the server frame time over a period, a time period. And that's matched up with a trace down below of the number of, of uh, AI and players in the world. 
And what it's really showing is that midwinter were able to increase the number of bots in their world by 50% while still hitting the same performance targets. And that's a really big change that actually fundamentally alters the experience of playing scavengers as a game. And AI count isn't the only thing they're able to experiment with. They're also able to make their world feel much more dynamic and realistic um, by increasing the number of items that can be interacted with. So that means things like more materials, um, more resources that can be collected, and also more wildlife um, and, and creatures roaming around the environment, which really help to bring it to life. So in summary then, um, choosing the right type of machine for what, what it is that you're doing and what type of workload you're running can have a really huge impact on you and your, your customers' businesses. And that's something that we've certainly found out improbable. And ultimately, the wide range of cloud machines that we have access to uh, through Google Cloud is, is really helping shape the next generation of more complex, engaging, and ultimately more impactful online games. And with that, thank you very much. Back to you, Aaron. Thank you, Patrick. <clears throat> Patrick and I only met very recently, but I was really excited when we were getting to do this presentation because it actually turns out that, uh, well, I live in Seattle and one of my friends is developing the game that he was, uh, uh, that he was showing off today. So I was like, oh, look at that. Um, these things just kind of work themselves out that way. Okay, so compute optimized, a little bit more about it now that you've heard some, some real life things and you don't just have to listen to me prattle on about how great this particular, our great VM families are. Um, they are especially useful, like I said, for HPC, gaming, search, performance sensitive workloads. Um, the C2 VMs offer more than 40% higher performance per core applications and things as single threaded, at least that's what we measure, but you know, as uh, Patrick pointed out, your Mileage may vary. Uh, Sometimes, you know, in many cases, we've seen people get even much better than that. They're built on the latest CP2 or CPU architecture with uh, second-generation scalable processors, um, highest gigahertz on GCP of 3.8 gigahertz, and sustained all-core turbo. Very powerful machines. And if you can stand up here and say 3.8 gigahertz for, with all-core scalable architectures very quickly, you can go do this next time because it takes some practice. Um, then these are, uh, by the way, these are also on, uh, uh, these are latest on Cascade Lake, I should point that out, right? So we're, again, we're starting to uh, introduce new architectures into GCP. Um, they are, the less core count, but a much higher uh, performance per core, scalable from four to 60 vCPUs. We are planning to introduce larger sizes uh, later in 2020. Um, and you can currently attach up to three terabytes of local SSD and run at 32 gigabits per second with, I believe, 100 gigabits in uh, beta today. Again, if you are interested in any of the, the betas or some of the things you can see me afterwards. So they offer near, so what, we're to, what we have with Compute Optimized is near real-time performance. Uh, optimize, we also optimize the software in the GCE stack uh, so that you get, you know, you have full visibility and transparency of the underlying hardware, explicit NUMA visibility to make sure that uh, you're getting the best uh, out of your memory to core ratios. Um, and of course, we manage the C state in the processor as well, just to like make sure that you get the extra boost out of when you're going with turbo. Uh, HPC, EDA, gaming, uh, like we heard from Patrick, are all very good uh, candidates for this type of workload, as well as certain types of financial um, uh, financial services transactions. So let's move now that we've talked about uh, uh, compute optimized VMs. We'll move over to another. Uh, let's say workload, workload optimized, uh, part of our workload optimized families, which is memory optimized, right? Uh, enterprises, small businesses alike rely on databases, ERP, and applications that are much more uh, demanding larger memory to compute ratios that are much more sensitive to memory changes than they are to compute. 
Memory Optimize are designed for these high-end critical business applications. They service things like SAP HANA, um, it, running uh, real-time analytics and things like persistent cash. We've seen uh, success with business warehousing, genomics, genomic analytics, uh, SQL analysis, and so on, right? For those of you who have been working in infrastructure for a while or working in the cloud, you are, I'm sure that you're aware that, you know, that, that, they're, that uh, if you have um, applications that are sensitive to memory, these things can become quite challenging. So we are scaling these um, up to meet your needs. 15 to 1 and 25 to 1 core ratios today. They are, op they are also priced in a particular way to optimize, uh, as opposed to N1, optimize for these types of, of high memory ratios. And we are, they, like I said, I think we uh, said earlier, we support up to 12 terabytes today, and we are in the process of scaling those. So in 2020, you will see larger sizes coming to market. Um, specifically for things like SAP, right? We really want to make sure that SAP customers have the value from the infrastructure that, we, that uh, we've invested and we've been, we've been passing that investment on to them. Um, customers can buy committed use discounts or can utilize committed use discounts for over time when they know that their workload, what the size and the shape of their workload is going to run. They can scale it up and down. Um, across the shapes and sizes that they need to, to work with the SAP or their other database architectures uh, as they grow with their business. So in review, um, applications needs vary by, uh, by use case across customers and over time. So finding the right VM for every workload is important. Uh, our general purpose VMs they have the best uh, performance for dollar offering with a, light, ride, a wide range of sizing, pr and pricing, and shape options. Um, our compute optimized are the highest performance core for real-time performance for gaming, HPC, uh, <clears throat> scientific, uh, and like perhaps search high-performance websites. Memory intensive workloads with the lowest dollar per, uh, per gigabyte in, in memory um, with, for high-end databases, real-time analytics, and of course, uh, preemptibility for the most economic options of saving up to 80% for bursty workloads uh, that are more fault, fault tolerant. So wrapping up, We went through a lot of content, um, but I want to reemphasize simple, flexible, and efficient. We've gone really over uh, just three different areas, right? General purpose, compute optimized, and memory optimized. We are not, in, we are not planning to make things complicated. We like to make things simple. We like to make them available. We believe that they should be available around the world and to meet whatever the applications that you need, right? We're designing architecture with the customer in mind. We're designing architectures and providing offerings with the flexibility uh, with the customer in mind and pricing them in a way that is the best per price performance uh, in the market. Um, we uh, will continue to scale these, uh, these offerings over time, compute, memory, and general performance, introducing things like AMD, uh, introducing things like um, uh, the uh, um, Intel Optane, uh, we are the first to, to, to introduce that into the market. So you'll see um, memory, memory optimized evolve in that particular direction over time. And of course, scaling all of these up and down as, uh, a, a, you know, as to meet our customers' workload needs. Easy decisions, simple steps. General purpose, memory optimized, compute optimized, tune it from there. With that, I'd like to thank you for your attention. Uh, Patrick and I will be here for the next 10 minutes or so to answer questions. Of course, uh, like I said earlier, please complete the survey. Let us know what you thought, whether you found this uh, session interesting. Uh, we always uh, appreciate your feedback and try and, and make things uh, a little bit better. Uh, there in the app, you can find uh, Dory, so you can put your questions up there and we can address them or we can take them offline. Um, if we didn't, if we don't, if we're not able to answer them immediately. Story. And thank you very much.